Hello and welcome to 18 WJTS Inform. I'm your host, Bill Potter. Joining us in the studio like he does on Fridays is State Senator Mark Mesmer. But you're dressed down today, Senator. It's a little bit. So well, this, this week was the crossover week for session. We got done Wednesday morning. And so normally I get home Thursday evening. I'm going to automatically have my suit ready for Friday. And I was just out of out of kilter a little bit this week since we're on short break. <laughs> well, also, for folks to understand, you are a citizen legislator. You well, have another job. I have a full-time job yeah. that actually pays the bills that I do have to go to uh, whenever possible. And I usually go in Fridays and Saturdays and sometimes Sundays, you know, on, when we're in session to try to, you know, keep up with things that are going on at my regular job. Now, we are at the midway point mm -hmm. in legislation, uh, so you've kind of like had a shortened week. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're going to recap for us some significant bills that have gone or that we'll be looking at, I guess. Yep. Well, I'll, I'll cover the Senate bills. I still haven't gotten too deep into the House bills that okay. passed. I brought the folders home from the bills that I'm sponsoring to start reading them this weekend, so try to get up to speed. But uh, this week, during our final Monday and Tuesday of dealing with Senate bills, we passed 59 additional bills, which gave us a total of 168 bills in the first half of session, which is less than a normal long session. But, you know, dealing with the pandemic and the, you know, the clunkiness of committees and shortened committee times, you know, it led to that. Uh, and of those, 52% of those bills were unanimous, which normally it's between that and 60% of, of bills being unanimous. And 92% were bipartisanly supported. And that, that is, that's probably on the, because we passed fewer bills than normal. I mean, normally that, numbers between 95 and 98 percent. But since we didn't have a couple hundred bills to deal with, it, some of them just break down, you know. And, and there's very few that were all Democrats opposed and all Republicans for. You know, a lot of them still, of those 92 percent, of this 8 percent, I mean, most of them still had, you know, some Republicans voting against. It was just maybe the 30 people that voted were all Republican. But still, uh, that's a huge percentage of bipartisan work that we continue to do in, in the in the Indiana Senate, and I think the House numbers would be very similar. And the House, the first half of session, passed 148 bills, which here again is, is low for them, but they really had restrictive numbers of committee rooms that they had available to them. So slowed them down you know, quite a bit the first half. So we'll start tearing into those bills next week, and uh, so I got a little reading to do in case any of them pop up in committee. Um, and then hopefully you know, my Senate bills, you know, I'm gonna start calling the House chairman and making sure you know, we're all good for a hearing. I think I think most of them are. Many of them I, I worked with, the, you know, with the House sponsor ahead of time, you know, to even know it's coming and, and have the process, you know, underway already. So look forward to a productive second half. But uh, this past week, some of the more significant bills that we worked on, <clears throat> one of them is Senate Bill 407, and that deals with uh, tightening up the, the use of the emergency order statutes that the governor operates under. And that's under Title 10. And, and some folks have said, well, why does the General Assembly think they have the ability to tell the governor how to operate during an emergency order? Well, because we gave him the authority to operate under emergency order. Okay. Title 10 was created by the General Assembly to allow the governor to have some, you know, some nimbleness to you know, react quickly to emergencies when they pop up, and they happen all the time. Tornadoes, earthquakes, you know, fires, floods, and we need to have, you know, that, that uh, quick response time for him to get, you know, get things dealt with. Uh, but what Senate Bill 407 does is say in a, you know, in, in this situation, now we're, you know, going at a year under his emergency orders, um, 60 days is the longest he can have an emergency order without having the General Assembly, you know, affirmatively, you know, give him the, the okay to continue it. And when we continue it, we can continue it for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. I mean, there's no limit to how far out we could say, okay, yes, you have, you know, you have approval to keep this emergency order going until X date. And when that get, date gets there, then, you know, he, he, we just, we don't say he has to call us in. He just, he just can't extend it without approval. Under the energy crisis emergency orders, that's the current statute. So we, we envisioned long-term energy crisis emergency orders. And within that Title 10 section, we said 60 days is as long as you can go, you know, without General Assembly approval. So really we're just being consistent in any kind of emergency. Uh, and within that, uh, we also require any federal money that comes in to help in, you know, whether it's an emergency, um, you know, natural disaster emergency, or in this case, they had the federal stimulus money. It requires that to be part of the budget or the state budget committee made up the of House and Senate 
fiscal leadership, you know, approve how that money gets allocated. Um, that didn't really happen this past year. So the government, the governor had $2.8 billion, billion dollars to do whatever he wanted with, which that, that, uh, that didn't, didn't sit well. <laughs> <laughs> we are the budgetary agency, just like the county council is at the local mm -hmm. level and money should be approved by the, by the folks with the budget authority. Uh, Senate bill 202 is one that we're calling compassionate care for people in nursing homes. And we've got a, uh, a definition of what we call essential caregivers, whether that might be close family members or uh, ministers for that person. Allow them, whether it's an end-of-life situation for the patient in the nursing home, or if, if there's situations coming up where maybe they've had a, you know, a loved one within the family die. I mean, times when you need to get in and, and spend time with that patient in the nursing home. Uh, it, it requires you know, nursing homes adopt policies to allow those, those essential caregivers to get, to get in to see that patient. And one of the reasons they were very reluctant to do that this past year was civil liability potential. Right. And, and, and we, fi we fixed that with Senate Bill 1 a couple weeks ago. So th that, that's something that I, th I think there was pretty, uh, a pretty constant cry for that across the state. And I think some nursing homes did allow those exceptions for what we call classified as essential caregivers to come in, but not, not all did. I'd say, you know, I mean, very few did, but now they'll all have to make accommodations for that. Um, Senate Bill 324, just a little, little you know, fun trivia thing. Um, sometimes churches have raffle tickets that they sell online or, or would like to, or duck race, things like the Jasper Chamber of Commerce has done in the past. Under charity gaming, currently you have to write a check or pay cash. You can't use a credit or debit card. Uh, so Senate Bill 324 would allow those transactions to be paid for by a credit card, uh, which you would have thought that would already be law, but it's not. So, so at the, the church picnics, you could, uh, before you had to write a check, check or give them cash, right? right. Well, now yeah, you can you, you use, could write, yeah, you could use a credit card. But just for charity gaming events, there's been a concern that you, you know they don't want to overlap into casino gaming mm -hmm. or other you know other you know professional gaming where people can rack up you know big bills on a credit card. So. Hopefully this will be the year that passes. I think we passed that same bill last year, but uh, the public policy chairman didn't hear any bills that we sent over last year. So hopefully this year it's a little more uh, uh, acceptable to him. So uh, Senate Bill 200 allows for the attorney general uh, to uh, assign a special prosecutor. If, if one county prosecutor decides, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna enforce any, any prosecution on a specific, you know, like if they say, I, they have a total class of crimes where they're just not going to prosecute on. I mean, that's really dereliction of your duty. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you should always have the individual ability to say, we're going to reduce a penalty or we're going to waive these four penalties if you plead guilty to, you know, I mean, that's, that's always part of the plea bargaining process or getting folks to, you know, to, you know, work out convictions outside of the, you know, going to court. But to say, I'm going to just take an entire class of crimes in the, in the example, the Marion County prosecutor said, we're not prosecuting any, any, uh, any marijuana violations at all of any kind. And so what's happened is people that are wanting to do drug deals, trafficking, they go from Johnson County, they get, you know, get into Marion County because they don't have to worry about prosecution. So uh, this would allow the Attorney General to assign an out of, you know, out of county prosecutor to, to deal with those uh, penalties. Not sure if the House will move it, but uh, I mean, when you have prosecutors that are just ignoring the law, you know, we've got to try to come up with a tool to deal with it. And uh, the last bill of interest was uh, Senate Bill 263, and that uh, restricts state or local government from passing any, uh, any restrictions on people going to church that are, you can't have restrictions on churches that are any more restrictive than they would be to other essential businesses in that community. So if, if you have a limit on how many people can attend, how many people can, can enter, you know, Walmart, say, based on occupancy, you know, that whatever occupancy level you put on other businesses is as is is a restrictive as you can be on churches. And that's really consistent with what U.S. Supreme Court determination has been, you know, with, with trying to restrict church attendance. I mean, I think California lost a case on that exact reasoning. They had a 10 or 25 person limit on churches and the U.S. Supreme Court said you can't do that. I mean, you can only you can only put restrictions in place that are the same as restrictions that all all other persons, all other businesses are being subjected to. Sometimes you wonder what well, that, that kind of makes sense. 
Uh, you would think. Yeah. yeah. And there might be a time where they ma mandate everything be completely shut down. And in that case, then churches would have to comply. So, so we get back into the business on Monday? Monday morning. Okay. Yep. And then it's uh, until we're done. Yeah, we'll run until, uh, I mean, our deadline's April 29th. And we'll, we'll usually try to wrap up a couple days early, not run you know, right up to the deadline. Uh, that way at midnight when the clock strikes 12, you have to stop. And one time during short session a couple years ago, three years ago, uh, we made that mistake and ran up to, ran up to the midnight, midnight clock and had about a half a dozen bills that really needed to be done that didn't get done. So that uh, mistake only happens once. Well, thank you very much for coming in. On your, I guess in a way, your week off, your time off. We really appreciate yep, you coming happy in. Happy to. Glad to be here. Our guest has been State Senator Mark Mesmer, kind of bringing you up to date on what's happening in the Senate as far as legislation is concerned. Thank you, Senator, for being our guest. Thank you for watching 18WJTS. We are local people watching local people.